college quarterback is calling it a season over a reported NIL dispute. Plus, we're talking to a just-retired NBA player and the president of an NWSL team. It's Thursday, September 26th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we're diving into the story of Matt Sluka, the UNLV quarterback who is sitting out the rest of the year over an NIL dispute. We'll be speaking with my colleague Margaret Fleming on that one. Plus, we have a conversation with Gordon Hayward, who just retired from the NBA, in studio with our reporter Alex Schiffer. We're also talking to Raven Jemison, president of the KC Current, who play in the first stadium built for a women's soccer team. Plus, the Pirates made a cut that's a bad look and maybe bad business, and Utah is considering raising taxes to help fund a new arena complex. First, let's hit the headlines. The San Diego Padres made the playoffs in just about the coolest way you can. With two on and no one out and the go-ahead run at the plate, the Padres turned a hard ground ball to third into a playoff-clinching triple play. Also, don't look now, but the Padres can actually still pass the Dodgers to win the NL West and secure a first-round playoff bye. San Diego has shown that if you build it, they will come. The team is fourth in MLB in average attendance with 41,117. That's around where they've been over the last three years after loading up on stars and becoming regular contenders. Former Milwaukee Bucks owner Mark Lazary is close to buying a controlling stake in the NWSL's NC Courage per ESPN. The team would carry a $108 million valuation. Lazary sold the Bucks to Cleveland Browns owners D and Jimmy Haslam at a $3.5 million valuation last year. He previously tried to get in on the sale of Angel City FC. Hurricane Helene is making its presence known in the sports world. The storm, which is projected to make landfall today, had winds of over 80 miles per hour as of Wednesday. Florida A&M and Alabama A&M have postponed their game this week. Meanwhile, the Mets and Braves are fighting for a playoff spot with a potentially season-determining game in Atlanta, but the weather could put MLB in a very challenging position. If you're in the Southeast, please stay safe. This sounds like it could be a big one. Fox rejected a request from Netflix asking Tom Brady and Kevin Burkhart to host one of their two Christmas NFL games. This year marks the first time the streaming giant will air games with matches between the Steelers and Chiefs and Ravens and Texans, filling out their Christmas Day slate. Netflix is reportedly exploring opportunities with Ian Eagle, Noah Eagle, Greg Olson, and Nate Burleson to call the games. UNLV quarterback Matt Sluka will sit out the rest of the season claiming that the school made NIL promises that were not upheld. Sluka reportedly was promised $100,000, but had received only $3,000 so far. By exiting now, he retains his redshirt rights, meaning that he can have an extra year of eligibility because he played fewer than five games. NCAA rules prohibit him from playing for a second school this season. UNLV's NIL Collective put out a statement saying that Sluka did not have any outstanding deals. My colleague Margaret Fleming has the latest on this, and she joins us next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports breaking news reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Hi, Owen. Hey, so UNLV quarterback Matt Sluka is sitting out the rest of the season over an NIL dispute. Um, a lot of uh, conflicting statements here. Uh, what do we know about what he says he was promised versus what he's actually getting? Very little. Um, but yeah, he's sitting out. Um, for context, UNLV, not a power school, but is playing like one right now. I mean, they are ranked 25th this week. It's their first ranking in school history. Um, he's been obviously a huge part of that and has been you know, playing great. Um, they, they beat... Utah Tech 72 to 14. So like this team is rolling. Um, and yeah, he announced late Tuesday night uh, that he would be redshirting the rest of the season. So he'd keep his eligibility for one more year. Um, he played at Holy Cross last year. He had four seasons there and was like a historic program player. Came to UNLV, has played three games and now is saying some commitments that I made when I decided to transfer here weren't upheld. Um, and because of that, you know, best of luck to you all, but I'm going to redshirt the rest of the season, um, which he didn't necessarily mention NIL, but when you say words like, you know, commitment or certain representations that were made to me, um, you know, you, and it's since come out from further reporting and further places in statements that that's what he was referring to. Um, and this is kind of the first time we're seeing somebody, drop out mid-season because of NIL. Yeah, and we're seeing this uh, this red shirt deadline become a deadline for anyone who, I mean, obviously it's a very specific scenario, but I'm wondering if at other points, you know, in future years, perhaps we will see this four game deadline as if you want to, um, you know, try again next year, um, you know, we, we might see players pulling a similar move if, you know, a bunch of different conditions are met. 
UNLV and its NIL collective have also put out statements. What are they saying? Yeah, very interesting. So the collective through Blueprint Sports, which runs a bunch of collectives, um, has said that there were no formal o- formal NIL offers that were made during the process. Um, they didn't finalize or agree to anything when he was part of the team, aside from like a community engagement thing um, that he did over the summer. Um, and then the school has said in a statement, and this is according to ESPN, um, that that Sluka's representatives, like his NIL agent, um, made financial demands to both the university and the collective. Um, and the university saw these as, uh, they quote it as a violation of the NCAA pay for play rules, as well as Nevada state law. Um, and that the university doesn't engage in such activity and it doesn't, uh, respond to implied threats. So that's, to me, that reads a pretty strong statement, um, of, of what's going on here. And I think the reason why a lot of this is interesting is because, you know, NIL is is kind of shifted into a little bit of a pay for play model. And that's sort of just like understood a little bit, a little bit. I'm not trying to be like too controversial here, but um, in in the world of college sports now, um, payers are getting played massive sums. We know this. It's reported. It's very under the radar, but pay, players are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially quarterbacks um, and happening in men's basketball too. Um, so it was very interesting for a school to release a statement and say um, these demands that he was making uh, violated the NCAA rules, which aren't being enforced right now because of, um, you know, court orders that have shut those down, um, temporary injunctions that have shut those down. And then also state law. It's it's really interesting that the university statement um, to me that it's coming out so strongly against this whole system of NIL. Yeah, yeah, no, it it is a pretty peculiar statement because yeah, some quarterbacks are getting millions of dollars, and this is just an established thing now. And yeah, the the um, NIL collective made a statement of you know it said he he did a charity event or some kind of school event, um, and that was you know part of his his an agreed to deal, but we had nothing else going forward. And that's what schools do if a player you know wants you know if they agree to give him let's say half a million dollars. They say, okay, you're going to do, you know, these five to 10 events and um, and you get your money for that. And that's how they they get around NIL rules. And, and yeah, the the implied threats thing is also I mean, maybe it's just the implied threat of him walking away, but it, it'll be very interesting to see if, if more comes out there. Yeah. Yeah. And ESPN reported that um, he had been verbally promised um, $100,000 at least. Um but then he's only gotten 3000 and they said it wouldn't be more than that. Um, they originally said it would be 3000 a month, which is still not going to add up to 100 Um, And then now he's only getting 3000 which um, if, again, we're, this is a group of five s- school. Um, it's not a power conference, even though that's a whole other thing going on that maybe next year or not next year, two seasons, whatever, um, whether or not UNLV goes to the Pac-12, you can talk to Amanda about that. But, um, but if, if this is, you know, existing within the framework of college athletics, the way it is right now, like still you would think that the quarterback would be getting more than $3,000 from the collective, even, even though it's not a power conference school. I mean, for the most part, like quarterbacks are making anywhere from like $500,000 to like you said, like millions, like even into above the two millions is kind of like a general range that power conference quarterbacks are getting. So you'd think like a hundred K for, a nationally ranked quarterback kind of makes sense. So I'm, I'm, if, if that's all true, which, you know, again, this is kind of a crazy situation. I'm, I'm kind of shocked that the collective isn't pushing harder to keep him around because if you're not spending money on your quarterback, who are you spending your money on? Where's that money going? Yeah. I feel like something doesn't add up here. Either he got more money than we've, you know, found out through reporting so far or, um, something weird's going on at UNLV or another school came through and said, Hey, we see you're playing great right now. You're having a fantastic season, red shirt the rest of your year. And next year we'll pay you, you know, $500,000 or a million dollars or whatever it is. And he sees the financial incentive there. I don't, I don't know necessarily. Um, I, I don't know. Obviously we don't know if that's the case at all, but um, that could be part of it. I mean, if he decide if he's if he's trying to strong arm UNLV, 
kind of doesn't seem from these statements like it's working. But if that's what he's trying to do, maybe he stays with the Raiders or the Rebels, excuse me, and goes on and, and continues there. But I think if he actually sticks through in red shirts this season, I'd be shocked if he stays there. And I'd be shocked if he didn't go somewhere else. And I'd be shocked if he didn't get paid way more than whatever it is that he's getting paid now or upset that he's not getting paid now. Like, um, if he sticks with this plan, he will get more money. But it's just interesting to see somebody choosing the money over currently being in a very good clearly they're doing great like choosing more money in the future over a very good football situation for yourself right now seems almost certain that someone's not telling us the full story here but i imagine it's going to come out at some point um we shall see margaret fleming thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me on Ryan Smith, owner of the Utah Jazz, Utah Hockey Club, and Real Salt Lake, wants a new arena for his NBA and NHL teams around a new development that could include the largest tower in the state. To make that happen, he would like $900 million in public funds, most of which would go toward the new arena. While there is momentum toward approving the project, there is some local resistance, including from a group that is concerned about the fate of Abravanel Hall, which currently houses the Utah Symphony. While Smith is not threatening to relocate his teams to an entirely different metro area, he can pit Salt Lake City against its suburbs because he owns land outside of the city where he could build his new arena. Economists are more or less in agreement that public subsidies for sports venues enrich the team owner, not the city. However, the prospect of losing a team is often more than legislators are able to stomach and most, but not all, eventually pay up. With just four games left in the regular season, the Pittsburgh Pirates dropped their DH Rowdy Telez, designating him for assignment. That would be an entirely unremarkable move, but with four more plate appearances, Telez would have earned a $200,000 bonus. Rowdy had a terrible start to the season, but has been much better in the second half before slumping in September. Pirates GM Ben Sherrington said the move didn't have anything to do with his bonus clause in his contract, which is either true or just something he has to say to try and avoid a grievance filing from the MLBPA. Either way, is $200,000 really worth the signal to other players that if you sign with the Pirates, they might do something like this to deny you a little extra cash? Ann Wolf, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who broke the story about the Mississippi welfare scandal involving Brett Favre, is facing potential jail time for defying a court order to reveal her sources connected to the scandal. Favre and the former state governor, Phil Bryant, are suing Wolf and her publication Mississippi Today for defamation, claiming they made stuff up with the intent of harming the two of them. A lower court ordered Wolf and Mississippi Today to produce documents that would have revealed sources. Mississippi Today editor Adam Ganusho explained in a New York Times op-ed that, quote, breaching the confidentiality of sources violates one of the most sacred trusts and breaks one of the most vital tools in investigative journalism. No serious news organization would agree to this demand. One thing that people often don't understand when these cases become public is that confidential sources are a key part of investigative journalism, and the people speaking to journalists generally have very good reasons for hiding their identities, and that good journalists verify all the information they get and say so when they can't. If Bryant and Favre believe that Mississippi Today has a vendetta against them, they'll need to explain all the corroborating reporting, including from us, that has come out since this story first broke. Up next, Gordon Hayward retired after the last NBA season, finishing a 14-year NBA career. He spoke to my colleague Alex Schiffer in our studio in New York about playing for the Charlotte Hornets as they were being sold by Michael Jordan, watching another of his former teams, the Boston Celtics, win an NBA championship, and his post-retirement plans. You'll hear excerpts from their conversation here, and for the full chat, you can check out our FOS interview series on YouTube. Here's Alex and Gordon's conversation. Welcome to the FOS studio. I am Alex Schiffer, and I'm joined now with recently retired NBA player Gordon Hayward. Gordon, what's going on? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. What brings you to town? You're an Indiana guy in the Big Apple. Yeah, well, uh, I've got a movie coming out. Um, so I was here to do the premiere. The movie is called Notice to Quit. Um, mm -hmm. It releases nationwide September 27th. Um, and so it was set in New York, and we thought we should do the premiere here. So that's, that's why I'm here. Have you always been a big movie guy? Was it something you got into more as a pro with all the time on the plane? Just what's your origin with all this? Yeah, I mean, I've always been into movies. Uh, we would always watch movies as, as a family growing up. Um, you know, when I first came in the NBA, you, they passed out like por portable DVD players on the planes. That's a throwback. It is a throwback. With the selections of CDs, you're kind of combing through the book and seeing what's available. Uh, so it wasn't as much watching movies then. Everyone was playing cards. Uh, but, you know, last year, as, as we moved on throughout my career, now everyone has their own iPads, their own laptops. You've mm -hmm. got almost endless content. So everyone's watching movies and shows and all that. So certainly a big, big movie, big show guy. And, 
you know, it's, it's something that I want to do now that I'm done playing basketball is tell stories and kind of uh, make movies. I was going to ask you, I looked up the movie a little bit myself. It's an uh, actor turned realtor, you know, has a daughter come back into their life. Uh, I'm not Egbert and Roper, but it sounds a little bit like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood almost kind of meets like Big Daddy. Just what can you say about the film and uh, yeah. what was it like? Just seek anyone's advice as an executive producer as to how to go about this all and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, this is, I've never done this before, so certainly was a sponge just soaking up everything and all the information and really just trying to enjoy the whole thing. The movie is, um, I'd say it's like a family comedy drama. Um, certainly follows kind of uh, this real estate broker in New York trying to sell these apartments. And, uh, you know, his daughter, he's got a daughter from an ex-wife and he's getting evicted from his apartment. She's being evicted from his life t by telling him they're going to move um, to Florida. And so it's kind of 24 hours following them in New York on a miserable summer hot day in New York. And he's kind of trying to figure out work-life balance and uh, really what's important in life. So it's, it connects with a lot of people, which is something that I think is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of people will, will really love the movie. Like I said, we had the premiere yesterday and people laughed, people cried. And if you can do that in 90 minutes, I'd say it's a pretty good day. Yeah. yeah. Have you done any acting? Or was there any thought of you doing a, a cameo in this? I don't think you have one. I've done commercials before mm -hmm. and if, I mean, once you do the commercial, you, it doesn't look like it's that hard, of course, because actors are so good at, at what yeah. they do, they make it look easy, but I'm a terrible actor, so I, unless I do acting lessons or something, maybe I can do some cameos, Yeah, like some Stan Lee just be in the corner of the yeah. scene or something like that. I was going to say, you came into the NBA after Entourage was on the air. That was like the one where that's, it feels yeah, like every player athletes. had like a five second. I know Steve Nash had a cameo in Entourage. It was a lot of who's who of like random yeah. athletes. I'll, ha I'll have to tell the, the my partner and the writer and director, Simon, just to stick me in a scene somewhere. Yeah. He did say I'm tall though, so maybe I could sit down in the scene or something. Yeah. You just retired. Did you go into last season knowing you only had a few more left? You know, there's always the talk of once the guys were thinking about retirement, you know, maybe that's when it's time to call it quits. Just what was your process like of, did you have interest during free agency? You know, what did you, when the thunder got knocked out, was that when your mind was made up? Did you kind of take us through how you arrived at yeah. your decision for all this? Um, I mean, it had been something I've been thinking about for a little while. I've, I've got four kids and they're getting older. And uh, last year was my 14th year, which is, crazy to think that, that, that time goes by so fast. Um, but it was, yeah, there was definitely interest in the off season. And, uh, you know, I thought about all the different teams and places I could have gone. And uh, for me, it's, it was, I was at peace with where I was at in my career and kind of wanted to move, move forward and do different things. And my kids are getting older, so I'm starting to miss some of their events and um, sporting activities. And uh, I felt like I wanted to be with them more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, that's kind of the reason. I mean, it's. It, I think as an athlete, you never know exactly when to retire. Yeah. Um, thankfully for me, I was like a choice. It wasn't like I uh, was forced to because no one wanted me or got a, some sort of major injury where I couldn't play anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I know obviously I've had a lot of injuries, but uh, the option was there to play, and I just decided to, uh, you know, just call it quits. At the movie premiere last night, you know, this is the time where media day is starting up for a lot of teams. A lot of guys are back in market. This is your first time to your point. Going back to college, where this time of year you're not at a basketball practice or getting ready for a season, just is it a weird feeling? And did you think yeah. about that all last night, the movie premiere, it's, where it's, it's like, I'm very doing weird. this? Yeah. yeah, it's so weird. It's like the first, I've been telling everyone, it's like the first time I'm going to have a legit fall where I'm not, like, I can watch football like a normal person mm -hmm. and, um, you know, lose money betting on games and uh, do the whole fantasy thing. And so it's, I'm excited for it. I mean, dressing up for Halloween, you know, usually we're either playing or, you got a game the next day and even holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, you can go into those holidays just more relaxed. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. With your retirement, you know, we talked a little, a little bit this off air, but you had the Players Tribune to announce your, uh, your move from the Jazz to the Celtics. And then obviously you announced your own retirement. You know, it's, it's been a, a post-mortem for the Woj era ending recently. Just curious yeah. for, you know, you being able to do that in a time where the news breaking stuff was always crazy and you know you try to have an announcement embargoed but then that sometimes would leak out just um right. you know you were uh you could have been one of the last Woj bombs but instead you got to announce it yourself and i'm just curious if that was uh if you thought about that at all with recent events yeah it's that it's it's in today's world it's hard to keep anything secret um, yeah and it does seem to get out some way or shape or form or, or another and so uh Woj was a good friend and he always did right by me so mm -hmm. um you know he's 
I wish him nothing but the best in his retirement, but certainly it's, it's nice to be able to control kind of the narrative and what I wanted to put out and with my retirement, just wanted to do something simple and so posting something on Instagram seemed like the best way to go. I want to take a walk back through your career if we could. You had sure. a number of stops and you had a lot of interesting things happen along the way. Just to start with your most recent stop with OKC, you know, you joined them as like the older guy, the vet at a time where they were like a young and up and coming team trying to make their announcement, make their arrival. You know, you got Shea, you got the Jalen Williams, you got Chet. Uh, they come into the season as a team that could obviously Maybe this is the year they make the conference finals or get back to the finals since the KD Russ era. Just, you know, you're only there a little bit, just your time in OKC and some of the guys they got coming up. What were your thoughts? Yeah, on that? I mean, OKC is, they have a bright future for sure. Um, reminded me a little bit of when I was in Boston with just the talent that we had when I was there. Um, just young guys who are, who are, you know, already there and already super impactful. Shea's, you know, probably been a top five player in the NBA for the last two or three years. Um, and they did finally put it all together and, and uh, you know, they, uh, I think we fell short uh, because of some experience, which that's, mm -hmm. you just got to go through that. Yeah. Um, you, you can't, I mean, it's something that you just have to do. And uh, so I think next year they should be really good too. They picked up some good additions. Uh, they stole one of the bigs from, from New York. Yeah. Um, picked up some good additions though. So. Uh, they'll be they'll be a threat for sure in the West. Yeah, watch where you say that on. Uh, we're not too far from the Garden. I think there's still. I don't know if you saw the Mitchell I, Robinson report that he's going to miss time. So that. Oh looked, really? Yeah, he's I out to start not. the season. So that that well, uh, I, Hartenstein I, departure looks a little bit tougher now. It yeah. does. Yesterday at the premiere, somebody came up to me and was saying, you know, talk to your guys over in OKC. They stole. I know he was beloved here. Yeah. Uh, which he's. Uh, I mean, he is a hard worker and does all the little things for you. And you need those guys if you want to win. Yeah. You came from to OKC from Charlotte, where you're there a few years. You know, you were there when the team got sold. You know, you missed out. They have that practice facility coming. They have the arena renovations. You just missed out on all the. Yeah, yeah. Out of curiosity, you know, obviously coaching changes happen every year. Ownership changes are a lot less frequent. Just how much of that is a conversation in the locker room and and something on a player's mind when it happens every now and then, every few years, and it's something that might not impact you. You know depending upon when the sale comes through and right. when the changes are implemented. Was that something that was on your mind at all when you were in Charlotte? Uh, so the last couple of years, it was just, the, you know, as we talked about getting things getting leaked, I mean, it, the word was out and uh, we knew it was about to happen, didn't know when. Um, and then when the sale does go through, it's like, well, it's, it's still gone through, but nothing's going to change for a little while. Um, we actually played the season and last season and really no changes until I think basically I got traded and then it started to be like, all right, the GM, new GM, um, you know, we're kind of basically going to go through another rebuild. They're going to do all these renovations, all this stuff, um, which I didn't get a chance to be a part of. Uh, but hopefully they can start to, you know, kind of pick up that franchise and turn it and put it, get it going in the right direction. Um, you know, I love my, my time in Charlotte and uh, we, we still live there now. That's kind of like the place where we call home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm rooting for that franchise. And then we talked about the Knicks a little bit. The Knicks have the Villanova reunion going on. Yeah. You kind of were the big college reunion in the NBA in recent years just with you reuniting with Brad Stevens when you went to the Celtics. By no means a one-to-one, -one, four college buddies and, uh, and you and your coach. I want to say you never played with Shelvin Mack in the NBA, right? I, I did. I played you with did. him in Utah, actually. That's right. That's right. I remember he was with the, um, the Wizards for a while. That's right. That's, so you've done this a little bit, but just, you know, since you've had it both with a coach and a, uh, and a teammate, what's it like going from Butler with these guys where, you know, the stakes were a lot lower, you guys were like the ultimate Cinderella story, mm -hmm. to the NBA where there's, it's a business, there's trades, there's stakes on the line. Just what was that adjustment like both with Brad and Shelvin? Yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly is a business. That's the biggest thing. Um, you know, when you're in college, you're kind of just like playing ball with your friends. Uh, because you're still you're going to class with them, you're hanging out outside of uh, you know the games and the court and the practices. The NBA, it's it's you're kind of it's I mean it is your job, and mm -hmm. uh, it was it was different playing for Brad in both. I think we had both grown up a lot. I mean when I played for Brad, I was you know 18 years old, and then the next time I played for him, I had at the time two kids. Um, you know he had changed; it had been seven seven years, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was just different. Um, you know I think. I really enjoyed my time in Boston as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it didn't work out exactly the way that we thought it would, a lot to do with my big major injury. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say it was some of those, you have some conversations that are just, that are just tough because, of, because it's a business. And so when I called him and told him I was leaving and going to Charlotte, like that was, that was a tough 
call to make. Mm -hmm. um, but me and Brad have a great relationship, and you know, I know that he's always in my corner, and and vice versa. And they're doing, I mean, they're they're doing pretty well, I'd say. I was gonna say, what was it like two uh, two part here? What was it like watching them win a title, given that you played with a lot of those guys when they were a lot younger and still coming right. into their own, and you played for Brad Stevens, you were not part of GM Brad Stevens. Right, so right. just him making that transition so successfully and also with those guys finally putting it all together. Brad is, no, I think no matter what he decides he wants to do in life, he'll be successful at it. That's just the type of person that he is and it's a lot because of the preparation and the hard work that he puts into everything. Um, but certainly great, I still have great relationships with a lot of people that are within the organization and I'm so happy for Joe Mazzula. He was an assistant when I was on the team. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, I just I wish them nothing but the best, and I, look, I mean they're set up again to to do very well this year. Um, so uh, rooting for those for those guys for sure. And then just when uh, we were reminded of this yesterday, when you had signed with the Celtics initially, that was during the whole Danny Ainge's son running for Utah yeah, yeah, Congress yeah. thing and everything. Did you ever have a laugh with his son? When you were up in Boston like that, like, hey, I'm sorry, my free agency somehow impacted yeah, we did. local politics. Just we, I imagine it was an interesting tongue-in-cheek conversation. It was, and Danny and I would laugh about it too because it's his son, you know. So he's, I'm, and he's the one that's stealing me from from the state, and or at least what everyone in the state felt like. And we definitely laughed about that. It's it's funny how sports and pol politics can kind of get intertwined and stuff. Gordon Hayward, enjoy your retirement. Good luck with the movie. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, man. The Kansas City Current are enjoying their first season in the first stadium built for a women's soccer team. I spoke to their president, Raven Jemison, on what that means for the franchise and the major expectations for the growth in the league. Jemison brings experience from all of the big four U.S. leagues, and she spoke about how she's translating that to the NWSL. That conversation is next. Joined now by Kansas City Current president, Raven Jemison. Welcome, Raven. Thank you, Owen. Nice to be here. Great to have you on. So this year you moved into CPKC Stadium right on the water in Kansas City. It's the first stadium built for a women's soccer team. How has having a place of your own changed things for the team? Um, it's probably a shorter answer as to how it's not changed. I mean, everything has changed. I mean, it's such a, a blessing to be able to have a place to call your own. And that's exactly what CPKC Stadium is for us. Um, the ability to program our stadium in the way that best fits us such that we can monetize our stadium and grow a business that is a real sports business is key for us. But of course, the world-class athletes that we get to watch play match in and match out. It, I think they would probably say it's unlike anything that anyone has ever experienced because they no one's ever experienced this before. Um, it's been great. The, the flexibility, again, to be able to have as a first tenant, to be able to have the matches that make sense for your schedule, but also think about what happens outside of KC current matches allows us to to grow into the mature business that we're looking to be. Um, we are still a, a young franchise, but the truth is we have to grow this business pretty quickly and, and mature such that we can be um, that preeminent sports franchise that that is seen all around the world. Yeah, a couple of threads I want to pick up on there, just in terms of like the fan experience, maybe the player experience, too. How would you say it's different from, you know, a, a stadium that, you know, maybe shares a venue with an MLS team or even a baseball team? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's necessarily different as much as there's more control over it. Right. So when we create our guest services standards, operational excellence and the SOPs that have to happen so we can create that world class experience, we are in control of that. Whereas if you were in someone else's stadium or arena you are pretty much beholden to their staff. You're beholden to their processes and you just hope that they deliver what you would deliver for yourself. So we are fortunate in that we run our food and beverage alongside Levy. We run all of our guest experience and our ushers and those that take tickets, our security team, they're being taught by us. So when we think about what we what we do from a front office standpoint and how we think about excellence in the same way as coach, I think, thinks about excellence on the pitch, we are able to articulate that to our staff. So it's our fingerprint that is on that experience. So I wouldn't say that the experience is different as much as the getting to that experience is different and us having more control over it. And again, when you think about 
how you mature as a business and how you can do the things in the right way so you can set yourself up for success. Those are the things you want to control because you want fans to come back. You want fans to talk about the experience so they can share the word and bring others. Right. And, and so and if someone has a bad experience, like, I don't know, with a vendor, or a ticket person or whatever, it's, it's you don't have to like then say like, well, that's not even us. <laughs> like, you know, that's. Um... And the truth is, the fan doesn't know that it's not you, regardless if it's here or, or elsewhere. They think that this is the Kansas City current that is parking their cars, that is taking their tickets. And the truth is, it is us because we take that very seriously. As a not just a sports fan, but like a human being who consumes things, there's nothing more frustrating than I have a problem with some transaction I had and everyone is blaming a different business or a different entity. It's it's, it's kind of the, the bureaucratic nightmare we live in sometimes. That's right. Um, in terms of, um, so you, you mentioned that you're, there's a lot of pressure to grow right now. Is that because you've know, got this new media deal coming in, there's so much investment and interest in women's sports and you kind of have to make good on that? Um. I think the the pressure is one in which we put on ourselves, right? Yes, there's a new media deal. Yes, there's eyeballs that are on our sport, unlike never before. And that's many women's sports um, leagues right now. But the truth is our owners have an unrelenting pursuit of excellence. And that pressure comes from knowing that they demand excellence. And we should all expect to be able to deliver on that. So the, the truth is pressure is a privilege. And the reason why I took this job is because there are there are eyeballs on us having done something that's never been done before. As we open CPKC Stadium and the first ever purpose-built stadium specifically for women's soccer. So that pressure just comes from knowing that we have to deliver, but also we have to get better. I think it, there's a there's a misconception that when you open the doors and the people just come, and then you just rinse and repeat every week. And the truth is that's not the case. There are things to learn every single week. And the pressure, when you talk about any pressure, is really just making sure that we deliver on the promises that we set out for Kansas City and those that are fans of the current. And I'm just curious, what what sort of things are you looking to as you sort of you know, seek to improve the experience and the business on that week to week basis? You name it. Food and beverage. How quickly, you know, soccer. I came from the core four major league sports and soccer was not one of them. So I'm learning that soccer, when the ball is being kicked around on the pitch, those 45 minutes, first half and the 45 minutes of the second half, no one's moving. They're watching the sport. So food and beverage is something that we're constantly thinking about speed of service. So if someone wants to get up and get a drink or someone wants to go grab a bite, how quickly can they do that? If they need to use the restroom, are there lines in the restroom? We're thinking about every single moment of our fan experience every week. And we do have post-match debriefs so we can kind of lock into where the pain points were for our fans. And the truth is every week is there's a learning lesson um, and there's something that we can always improve upon. And if you look at not, not just week over week, but because this first year is our first year in existence in this stadium, we're looking at how we can improve Overall, we should not be making the same mistakes as we're making this year. Not to say those mistakes are intentional. We've just never done it before. So how can we improve not just week over week, but year over year and make it so it is a little bit of a rinse and repeat and everyone has that culture of, of excellence and that standard that is so high that we are making and, and hitting that mark. So yeah, you mentioned this is your first soccer team, but you came from the three years with the Milwaukee Bucks. Before that, you were on with Pittsburgh Pirates, Florida Panthers, San Francisco 49ers. So you fit every other popular American sport, basically. What are you bringing from those experiences to your current role? Well, I'm hoping not to bring any of my bad habits that I established in those those other roles. But I think the the truth is the job is the same, right? At the end of the day, we have to make sure tickets are sold. We have to make sure brands are partnering with us to, to, to buy marketing partnerships. We have to make sure that the brand is world-class and the top upper echelon. All those things are the same. So what I'm hoping to bring to this role is just a knowledge base of what good looks like. But what I'm also hoping to do in this role is think differently around sports in general, sports business in general. Because we don't kind of have the, the heavy weight of multiple decades of existence, we kind of have a blank slate to do what we feel we need to drive business, to drive eyeballs and align with partners and brands that make sense for us. Um, I think we definitely, what I hope to accomplish is bringing some of the best 
from the previous roles I've had while also marrying some of the next, if you will, because this is a, a new frontier. Um, we're a very young league and we're a very young team. Sky's the limit. And I'm excited about what we can do to kind of change that mindset with respect to sports business. And are there things you can think of that you, you know, you've done with the current that you, you just maybe wouldn't fly or would maybe, you know, just be, um, uh, a more difficult sell with a team with a longer history, you know, like the pirates or the Niners? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that I could pinpoint anything specifically right now, but what I would say is just the mentality. So what tends to happen when you come with decades of experience, maybe championships in your belt or winning product on the court, the ice, the field, there tends to be a little bit of comfort in that room that you've already had an established brand. Whereas when you walk into the room with the Kansas City Current, I think we've done a fantastic job of building our brand and establishing it in the world as the first and purpose built and all those things. I think what we've tried to do differently here is come into a room without any preconceived notions. Who we are as a brand and who we want to align with as a brand is very important to us. So I would say that the beauty of what we get to do in this space is we can be a little bit more selective because we are growing as a brand and we want to make sure that we align with brands that are looking at us and growing with us. Maybe not just picking the first check that somebody wants to give to you because they want to sponsor your team. Um, not to say that, that that's what happened in every role that I was in, but I do think we have a little bit of opportunity to identify brands that can elevate us and vice versa. And I know you don't necessarily have the before and after picture here, but the NWSL this year started a, a new media deal where they're getting $60 million per year up from, I think, $1.5 million. So huge change for the league. Have you felt that, um, you know, just in how you do business? Well, I felt it in how I communicate where our games are, where our matches are. I have a lot of friends, as you pointed out, I came from all over the country. And the beauty is I have a great support circle that is pumped about me in this role because they want to support women's sports. So I think what I have felt personally and what is going to be helpful for the NWSL is people are watching and they want to watch. So my mother-in-law, for example, was on our app and she's like, whoops, I see that the game is on Amazon tonight. Let me make sure I am all set for the match. That, I don't know if that was happening before in the NWSL because I was not here, but I can say that I have people that are consistently invested in making sure they know where the NWSL is playing. We've done a really good job of establishing those tent pole nights and articulating where we are every night. Um, but I think personally and professionally, and for, I think our brand, our fans are watching and they, they can easily access even with NWSL plus and being able to watch it in app or through uh, the league's app. It's really about access. And I, I think that's just going to help our business overall. And do you feel like we're in a, this um, a transition phase from, you know, people investing in women's sports because they feel like it's the right thing to do um, and people checking out women's sports because they're they're curious and they want to support to, you know, people just being interested as a business opportunity because it's a good business and as a fan because they're just invested in the teams and the players. Are, are we where are we in that? If that is an accurate way to frame it, where are we in that, that progression? Yeah, I think we're on a rocket ship. The question is, is the rocket ship going to continue, continue to ascend or is it going to level out? I think we're on a rocket ship that's going to ascend until somebody stops us. The truth is the conversation around women's sports is changing and it is not just it's the right thing to do, not just equity and how do we make sure we insert ourselves in this space from a community perspective. It is a sound business decision. And you can tell that by the level of people that are investing in women's sports and having conversations around women's sports. It's not just a, okay, I'm gonna do this because my daughter plays soccer or my daughter plays basketball, I'm a girl dad. Or if you're a, you know, a successful business woman and you've played sports before, you're investing in women's sports because it gave something back to you. And I think we're seeing the conversation is changing in general across the investment in women's sports and it's definitely here to stay and we will sustain this growth and we understand that brands are catching on too so i the answer to your question is we are on that rocket ship and it's going to take a little bit of time to stop us 
part of that growth, obviously, is adding more teams. So the NWSL is 14 teams right now, um, where, and which leaves a whole lot of big markets open. Um, how do you see the league kind of managing and, and taking advantage of that opportunity? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question for Jessica Berman, because I know she's in it, as well as, you know, our, our owners who are looking at partners in this league. And that's, I think that's the difference. Expansion to me at this stage in our league is about finding partners that are going to align with the vision of growing the sport, developing the world-class athletes that we have the opportunity to watch every match and ensuring that they're taken care of in a way that they haven't been in before. So how I look at expansion is we're going to be intentional. Um, if, I, if I know Commissioner Berman, she's going to be intentional alongside our ownership groups um, to ensure that we're finding the right people that want to invest in women's sports. We just talked about that rocket ship. It, a rocket ship, like I said, can only be stopped if the people on it probably stop it. And I think we're in a position where we are aligning ourselves with people who are invested in this for the long run to ensure that we are providing the facilities, the investments, the resources, and building the right front office teams to make sure we are taking care of the players that we are blessed to watch every week. Yeah, absolutely. We'll leave it there. Raven Jemison, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. Thank you for having me. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we take a look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Oakland A's played their last home game in Oakland this afternoon, and fans attending games this week have started to take home pieces of the stadium, including seats. Reminder to A's fans going today, the USL team, the Oakland Roots, will be using the Coliseum next year, and unlike the A's, they are committed to Oakland. Let's leave them a stadium to work with. I have tickets for today's game, and I hope I still have a place to sit down. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, let us know on your favorite social platform or send us a note at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.